Are these your parents? Andrew, that's a full. Hassan. All right, we'll wait a few more minutes, maybe 30 more seconds. I see it, I see it. Everyone's doing a great job. Sarah. Oops. Sarah is the Is the recording starting? Did, am I, okay, all right. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I know this says it's the second talk, but it's actually the third talk, serving slash loving others. Um, uh, at the retreat, we talked about the, the first talk on service, which was the ethos of serving and, and service in general. And uh, just to kind of recap a little bit, since I know most of you weren't at, that, uh, at the retreat, um, we, we, had the, we talked about the difference between the knowledge and the heart and that sometimes service becomes a spirit of reading books, learning things, and, uh, and then disseminating that information. So I read something and then I tell it to people. Whereas um, true service is more than just that. Um, true service is more than that, but true service actually goes after the pride of the self of the servant, right? And focuses on digging deep as you serve God and as you see in yourself. Uh, as you see in yourself the parts of you that you want to change. So service turns out to be a way for me to get closer to God. And we see this. Um, in the liturgy, so cute. We see this in the liturgy of St. Gregory, right? In the liturgy of St. Gregory, you all know that in the Eid, we will say this liturgy, of course, it's like midnight and we're all hungry and we want meat. But there's this one part that I love where it says, um, you don't need our service, but we need your lordship, right? And we always say this in the, in the service because that's ultimately what's, what's going on here and the reality. So I want to read to you from John, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. The third time he said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And so I want you to see the relationship in service and the direction. It's very important. Do you love me? And if so, feed my sheep. And that direction is very important because sometimes we, we mix the direction. Sometimes we say, you know, when you serve, you'll learn to love God. That's true. You'll certainly get closer. But that, that, that direction is important, right? I have to... I have to find my love of God first, right? There has to be a fire first. I have to take first, and then I give. And once we mess that up, then giving becomes the thing that I need to do because I have to serve God, because I have to go into heaven. So the way I get to heaven is by serving God. But I haven't taken yet, right? And so that first step is a very important step. And in fact, the most successful servants tend to be the ones who lived really bad lives before, right? The ones who just did all kinds of things. And the reason they're really successful servants is because they lived these lives and then they came back and when they come back, they touch God and they feel how much he loves. We talked about it in the retreat, the parable, the story that Jesus said when he says, if someone forgives you 500 denarii or someone forgives 50, who loves more? And he realizes the more you're forgiven, the more you love. And the more you love, the more you feed my sheep. 
So that love of God is kind of the fire. And once you're off the fire, it's a problem. And I, I heard a, an analogy once 35 years ago. And, you know, if you draw, a, if you put a, a pot on a fire, right, and that pot starts boiling with water, okay, and then you take another pot and you touch the first pot, eventually that second pot, you know, conducts electric, you know, conducts heat, the second pot will start boiling. And you can take another pot and you can touch that second pot and then that pot will start boiling. And as long as that first pot is on the fire, it can boil a lot of pots and heat up. The only problem is if I take that fire off, then everything goes cold. And when you're off the fire, you have nothing to give. When you're not feeling God's love, you have nothing to give. And how do you not feel God's love? As soon as you stop repenting. As soon as you stop acknowledging him. As soon as you stop seeing him, the fire goes off. Eventually your pot gets cold and the pot next to you gets cold and the pot next to it gets cold. And next thing you know, your whole Sunday school class is cold. And there's no love and there's no fire because there's no repentance. And of course, the word repentance is a very important word, right? What does the word repentance mean in Greek? What's the Greek word for repentance? Yeah, what's the Greek word? Huh? Metanoia. Metanoia. I don't know how to say it in, as an American. Metania. I'm going to say it like a father, right? A metania. How do you say it in English? Metanoia. Ooh. It's kind of like athanasius. All right, athanasius. Athanasius, okay? So anyway, um, what was I talking about? So repentance is turning away, right? It's, it's changing direction. And there's two pieces to repentance, right? First piece, if I'm changing direction, means I was looking left, right? I'm looking at something bad. And changing direction means I look at something right. So there's two pieces to that. First piece, stop looking at the bad. Second piece, more important piece, start looking at the good. Looking at whom? At him. And that's why during Lent, we say something over and over and over again during Lent. We say it during the fraction. We say it during the, 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 the doxologies. What do we say over and over? Huh? Fasting and prayer. Why do we say two things? First one's fasting. What's fasting? I withhold. I withdraw. I stop looking at the left. I stop. I curb my desires. I curb my whatever. But then the second part is as important, if not more important. And prayer. So that's now me turning and looking to the right. A lot of us go into the Lent and say, I'm going to stop these bad things. That's just morality. That's not Christianity. Right? Stopping bad things isn't being Christian. That's just being moral. That's, stop, that's the, lift, the left. But I got to turn and I got to face him. Right? Love me and then feed my sheep. That direction is very important. And how do we love people we don't like, <laughs> as you asked once? He says, never confuse the person formed in the image of God with the evil that is in him. Because evil is but a chance misfortune, an, an illness, a devilish reverie. But the very essence of the person is the image of God, and this remains, him, remains in him despite every disfigurement. So we don't confuse people with evil. Nobody's evil. They are the son of God, every single one of them, right? And no matter, you know, who it is, or if, even if it's the opposite team that's playing against Toronto, they are also the sons of God, although we hate them, right? So the way we, the way we get there, right, is when I see somebody doing something, I think to myself, and again, the Bustan, the paradise of the fathers is very useful here. In the, in the Paradise of the Fathers, one of the, most, um, one of the quotes I really like, it says, When you see your brother sinning, you say to him, I curse you, Satan, my, my brother is not at fault. I curse you, Satan, my brother is not at fault. And here you see St. John of Kronstadt saying the same thing. Don't confuse the person formed in the image of God with the evil that is in him. That's different. That comes from the devil. That's outside of him. That's not him. Right? And I will still love my brother regardless of what they do because what they do isn't them. It's what Satan has convinced them to do. There's a long story. I don't know if I should read it to you, but I, I told a, a similar story 
uh, at the retreat last time, but you know, imagine you're, you're, you're walking out in the Africa somewhere, right? And you hear someone screaming, like screams of like pain and suffering and like, you know, death screams. And you run over to hear what's going on and you see this lion attacking a person. And he's attacking the person, and he's about to kill this person. Would you go and take a rock and start hitting the person with the rock and just plucking the person? No, right? It's not nice. It's being attacked. It's being attacked by a lion, right? And what does St. Peter say? Satan is like the lion that's waiting to devour us. And so when I see my brother being attacked by a lion and breaking down, and losing this battle, should I throw rocks at my brother? Should I kick him when he's down? Curse at him, judge him, condemn him, hate him, gossip about him, cancel him, whatever the case may be? Or should I kind of take the line off him, help him out, give him a stick or something to, to fight back the line with? So at the end here, the second paragraph, he says, we should feel the malice of the other person as an illness, which is tormenting him and which he is unable to shake off. And so we should regard our brethren with sympathy and behave with courtesy towards them, repeating in our hearts with simplicity the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, so that the grace of God may strengthen our soul so that we don't pass judgment on anyone. We should regard all people as saints. We all carry within us the same old self our neighbor, whoever he is, flesh of our flesh, he is our brother. And according to St. Paul, we owe no one anything except to love one another. We can never pass judgment on others for no one ever hated his own flesh. So sometimes we know, we say, well, you know, how do we not judge? How do we not, you know, if I see someone, you know, killing someone, I can say, you know, killing is not nice. And I can say, you shouldn't kill someone. And I can say killing is wrong. And I can say killing is a sin. But for me to call you a killer and to judge you as a person, that's a very different story, right? And if I see the fact that you killed someone as the influence of Satan, this outside third party, then I can look at Satan and say, why'd you, why'd you do that to this guy? Why'd you do that to the son of God? Why'd you fool him like that? Why'd you torment him like that? Let the mouth, this is from St. John Chrysostom, let the mouth fast from disgraceful and harsh words because what gain is there when on one hand we avoid eating chicken and fish and on the other we chew up and consume our brothers with words. We fast and we don't eat the flesh of meat but then we eat the flesh of our brethren by gossip. Far worse fast, far, far worst breaking of the fast. And so we have no problem, as St. John Chrysostom says, not eating chicken and fish, but yet we eat the flesh of our brothers, right? And so again, once we go back to this concept of seeing our brethren as who they are, the sons of God, our brethren, our adopted family, flesh of my flesh, bones of my bones, part of my body, it's very, very difficult for me to hate, judge, cancel, attack anybody you know, that's like an autoimmune disease, right? Where the, where the body turns on itself. And we can never allow ourselves to be that way. And the easiest way to do that is to see the source of the evil. And the source of the evil is not the person doing the evil. The source of the evil is the devilish reverie, right? It's someone outside of this that we can't see. So I want to talk a little bit about the difficulty in service. This is a nice quote. I'll tell you why it's nice. It's very depressing, as most of my quotes are, as, as most of my talks are. There never was and never will be a place on earth free from sorrows. The only sorrowless place possible is in the heart when the Lord is present there. Interesting. Right? And I think, you know, there are whole industries devoted to finding happiness, the travel industry and marketing all these, you know, skin products and surgeries to get your lips done and your boobs done or whatever done. And everyone's trying to find happiness 
did I just say boobs in church? Um, and I'm just, and everyone's trying to find, <laughs> I mean, that's what they are. Um, I, on the internet, hello America, um, Canada, wherever. <laughs> um, and so we have entire industries devoted to looking for happiness, searching for happiness, right? And you know, you even see this like, um, in the life of, uh, of humans, right? So, you know, right around the age of 50, a lot of guys get a Ferrari, right? Or they get an, a third wife, or they get a whatever, right? And, and you gotta wonder what's, what's going on? Why the Ferrari? What's happening? What do we call that? Midlife crisis, right? So what's a midlife crisis? Midlife crisis is, you know, when you're 20, you thought, oh man, if I just get a, I just want to get through college and get good grades, man, if I get through college, I'll be so happy. Then you get through college and you're like, man, if I just get a job, I'm going to be so happy. And then you're not happy. Then you get a job and you say, if I get promoted, I'm going to be so happy. And then, but if I get married, I'm going to be so happy. And as we discussed yesterday, thank you, that doesn't always work out. And then if I have kids, I'm going to be just so happy. And then as we discussed, that didn't work out. But if I get a bigger house, then I'll be so happy. And then that didn't work out. And then if I get a second house, the one in Florida, I'll be so happy. That didn't work out. But if I get a boat, now I'll be happy. No. But if I get those Nikes, I'll be so happy. Or that purse, or that jacket, or that watch, I'll be so happy. So then eventually you get to an age where you've done all of it. And then you realize nothing made me happy. Nothing worked. And the reason nothing works is all of us have a hole inside us. We're all empty, all of us. The emptiness, that hole, is infinite. And it's a God-shaped hole, if you will. Right? And the only thing that fills that hole is Him. And what we do, we spend our entire life doing this. Starts as a teenager, right? You start, you know, drinking, drugs, girls, boys, whatever, right? And you start putting things in the hole hoping that you get filled, you get satisfied because something's missing or that doesn't work. And you just keep trying thing after thing after thing and spending a lot of money doing it. And then if you only traveled here, if only you did this to your body, if only you did this, if you got this tattoo, if you got this piercing, if you got this, whatever, everyone's selling you on happiness and you spend all your money and you realize nothing works, nothing. And then you have the crisis like, holy moly, nothing worked. I've done everything this world has to offer. I got my third wife, that didn't even work. Nothing. And that's when you have the crisis, right? And what, and so I'm, I'm, I'm actually saving you all a lot of money right now by telling you this, right? So what, huh? Too late. <laughs> this one's too late, this one's like ruining my plan. <laughs> if anyone has issues, just give me the money. As I know how to spend it, no. Um, and so what this saint is saying, although it sounds very depressing, it's actually very liberating. Just stop trying. Stop letting the world try to fill you. I'm, I'm saving you a lot of effort, trust me. There never was and there never will be a place on this earth that's not have sorrow. You can go on an island, you can go to Tahiti, you can go to wherever you want, whatever catalog you look at, whatever internet site that that's, gives you happiness, and then it's, it's, it's fleeting. And he says, the only sorrowless place is in the heart. And not just in the heart when you're alone, like you're a solitary, but when the Lord is there, right? And this is exactly what Christ told us. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is where? It's inside you, right? So, you know, even when we pray, don't look up, look in, because that's where he is, right? So what this tells us is everywhere we go, there will be difficulty, and we discussed it yesterday about marriage, but we can discuss it about service today, children, you name it. Right? There's difficulty everywhere, and that's just life. And so the, the, the objective isn't trying to get out of the difficulty because it's just not going to work. I'll let you know that one too. Right? It's you go inside, and you find God inside. And then, as we talked about this morning, um, when you're deep in the ocean, it doesn't matter what the waves are doing, doesn't matter what the wind is doing, doesn't matter what storm is brewing, you just find people, and there's people like this, right? It could just be the house is just burning down, and everything's crashing, and people are sick, and people, are, and these people are just calm. It's like nothing. 
out there because they're so deep with God, right? Their experience with God is so deep that it's like nothing shakes me, nothing rattles me anymore. This is a long quote, but I think it's worth reading, so we'll all read it together, especially in the service. Sometimes we find ourselves at odds with another person, and we stubbornly, stubbor stubbornly insist he is at fault. He's the one who became angry. He's the one who spoke to me rudely. He must humble himself, not me. I've never said these things, but other people do. If he had spoken to me calmly and addressed me with respect, I would have been patient and would not have been offended. Hence, he is to blame. Sounds like every conversation I have with most people, and including myself. Behold the passion of egotism. This is all just ego, guys. We must oppose such thoughts by responding, no, no. If I did not have egotism, if I didn't have an ego, I would not be bothered. And again, we talked about this yesterday, right? Why are you bothered when someone comes at you? If you look at it deeply, it's always the same story, right? It's the one sin. It's what Satan fell from. Pride. Hence, I am to blame. My brother is not at fault. If I had humility, I would have taken this opportunity to gain a crown. And I would view this person as Jesus' cauterizing instrument. You know when you cauterize something? Like you burn it, but then you fix it. So burning hurts. Right? Isn't that, isn't that what Jesus said? The, the branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. What is pruning? Take a pair of scissors and you cut the branch. Now, if you're the branch, does that hurt? That hurts. And that's the branch bearing fruit. So he prunes it and he cuts it and he cauterizes it so it bears more fruit. He is cauterizing my passion so I can become healthy. He is helping me now. The person who just said all those mean things is helping me now. He is my benefactor. I must embrace him, love him, and pray for him because he actually did me a favor by revealing my sickness. So when someone comes at you and you find yourself really upset about what they did, thank them for revealing your sickness. That's so true. If I had not spoken... If, if he had not spoken to me in this manner, and if this temptation had not transpired, I would have remained unaware of the extensive egotism within me. And I would have never realized that I need to struggle against it. The sting of this temptation uncovered my sickness. This is what I was telling you earlier when I said, uh, don't worry, God will send you something to help you along. This is who he sends. Jerks. Now that I have seen it, I will make sure I apply the medication in order to be healed. And believe me, so many times we think we're past certain temptations or certain trials or certain... And I can't tell you, you know, how many times I've told people in the service, well, you know, it's good for you and this helps, you know, reveal your this and reveal your that. And then when it happens to me, it's like, dang, I didn't see that coming. I didn't think that was still in me. And every once in a while, someone will elicit a reaction out of you that you're just like, I didn't think I was capable of that reaction. I didn't think I could get that mad. I didn't think someone could poke me in that way. And then God sends you that perfect guy or girl, right? The perfect situation who says all the right things and all the right way to just piss you off beyond reason. And then you realize, oh man, I guess I'm not as good as I thought, right? I guess there's still some of that stuff in me Thank you for pointing that out to me. Thank you for showing me I have work to do. Thank you for showing me my ego. Now? <laughs> I love him. Like, I'm taking you back with me. I'll get you a green card. We'll get married because that's legal in ours. And so we're doing this. He's mine. You look out. That's him. So this is something we talked about a little bit yesterday. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, especially in the spirit of service. One thing we have to be careful is about knowledge. Knowledge is dangerous sometimes, especially half-baked knowledge. When 
You know, when someone knows nothing, they're not that dangerous. When someone knows a little, they're very dangerous, right? The last thing you want is a doctor who thinks he knows. You know, like the second year medical student says, let me, let me take care of this. Like, no, no, thank you. I'll take the doctor, please. No, 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 I know how to do it. No, you don't, right? And those are the most dangerous people. To summarize, the Christian servant is not just a teacher of lessons, but is in the first place a leader of souls to salvation. The first priority and central preoccupation of Christian service is to lead the souls of men and women to repentance and to train the young in the paths of virtue and the fear of God. So once again, once, once we start getting knowledge about the church and about the Bible and about the fathers and about the history and about the whatever else you want to study, we have to be very wary of that knowledge and how we transmit it to the kids. Right? Because once they sense puffed upness in us, or worse, once they watch us fight with the other servants, right? Because we just saw what fighting is, right? There's one word, ego. Two servants fight, we got two ego problems. That's all that means, right? And the service is good for one thing, fleshing out ego, right? Because you get in the service with people, people are passionate, people want to serve God, people want to do what's right. And people don't like what other people are doing, right? Because what other people are doing is dumb. What I'm doing is smart, right? I was just talking with, with um, you know, at the break, you know, even the, the story of the five loaves and the two fish is just, you know, so instrumental, right? You know, Jesus says, what are we going to do to feed all these people? And the answer that, the, that Andrew comes up with is really bad. It's really dumb. Hey, I got this kid with one plate of food. Like, what would you do if, 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 if you asked, the, hey, how are we going to feed these people? He's like, hey, I, I got this kid. You're like, are you dumb? Like, is that, is that the answer you're going to give me? A plate of food for 5,000 men? It's a bad answer. It's not very smart. It's not going to work. Nothing about it works. And then God says, okay, we'll do that. It's amazing. And so sometimes in the service... You know, the servant, the Sunday school teacher next to you has the really bad idea and you have the really good idea because it's your idea and that's the good one. And they have the bad idea. And then sometimes you just say, okay, well, let's, you know, maybe God can bless the bad ideas. Can God bless bad ideas? Yeah. You know, there's a famous story from the, from the desert fathers of St. John the Short, right? His father said, take a stick, plant it in the desert, and then walk for miles and water it. Stupid idea. And then God wants to show you, look, I can take a really bad idea and I can make a tree out of it that lasts for 2,000 years, right? So can God bless really? Of course he can, as long as what? The egos melt. And that's very hard, especially as you start moving up in the service and you've been doing it for a few years and you're leading a few classes and you're doing the stuff and I know what's up and I know what's you know, happening and I know what this church needs and I know what people's needs are. Ego, 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 ego. And then someone comes up with some really bad idea. Let's, like, let's, you know, take this plate of food as one little kid has. And you're like, ah, that's a horrible idea. But God can work with those. We talked about this a little bit, but I, I kind of want to uh, double down on it a little bit. Being versus doing. So I'll read you a passage from the, um, the Sermon on the Mount. You all know this part. We say it every, the sixth hour. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous snake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. And on and on and on, on, right? This is one of the most beautiful. This is the, the constitution of Christianity, right? This is one of the most beautiful sermons ever given in the history of the world. What's happening here? What's God saying? Is he telling us to do those things? Is he saying this is stuff you have to do? These are orders. These are commands. If you do these things, I will give you heaven. If you don't do them, I will give you hell. Or maybe he's just talking about himself. Is this, do these verses apply to Jesus? Sure. So maybe he's even telling you what to do. He's just telling you who he is. This is who I am. 
And we talked a little bit about this at the retreat, right? When he says, you know, forgive someone seven times, 70 times, is he really telling you to forgive someone 490 times? Or is he saying, I forgive infinitely. You're my son, aren't you? You think like me and talk like me and act like me? Well, this is me. I'm meek, I'm merciful, I'm pure in heart, I'm a peacemaker, I'm persecuted for righteousness sake. This is who I am. Are you my son or not? And then you judge. And then if you see yourself missing in one of these areas, you say to yourself, hmm, maybe I got something to work on. Maybe there's a little bit of ego still in there that I'm not these things. So these aren't things I'm supposed to do to be good so I can earn heaven. These are measures of my life with God. Am I like my father or not? Am I in, in his image and likeness or not? Because this is who he is. So maybe these aren't prescriptions for us to be like perfect robots. I'm supposed to be merciful. I'm supposed to be merciful, right? You know, the old adage, right? If you have to tell yourself you're humble, you're not humble, right? If you say, I have to be humble, I have to be humble. Okay, I have to be humble, I have to be humble. Then you're not humble. Like you're forcing yourself, you're faking it. You're pretending to be humble. You know, you do the top tub thing, right? And, and everyone goes, wow, that guy's really humble, right? Or, you know, every time I... Someone wants to, you know, open the door for me. I open the door for them. I said, no, and fadal, fadal, fadal. We do this nine times, right? And the most humble wins. And I always win because I'm the most humble. So maybe the Lord is telling us about himself. And are these commandments telling us how to act or telling us about who God is? I already said all these things. So Christ came for our salvation. And a big part of that is to teach us about who God is. And he's correcting these misconceptions. So what we want to look at these things especially with the kids in class, is they need to see it in us, not because, you know, and this kind of goes back to your question earlier, not because I'm saying, okay, I have to be meek so that the kids see me being meek, because they're going to figure out I'm actually not meek. At one point, they're going to see me getting into a fight with the other servant, and, they, and they, you don't know that they're listening, but they're listening, and they're going to know, or they're going to hear something in my voice, they're going to see something in my face. Kids are very smart. Kids are, adults are very smart. And I want to focus on this very important verse. For me, this is like the, the quintessential, this is Christianity. Matthew 25, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was in sick and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. I was naked and you clothed me. And so again, what is this passage telling us? And this is very important. Is it telling us that we need to do these things to earn heaven? Because he does say, right, at the end of days, right, I will separate the, the sheep on the, the goats on the left and the sheep on the right. And I will say, for you were, I was hungry and you fed me and I was thirsty, etc., etc. But notice he said for and not because. Because these are signs that I lived with Christ. Because if he said because, he says, you're going to go to the right, you're the sheep, you're going to go to heaven because you fed the poor and you visited the sick and you did all these things. And I'm going to say, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go visit the sick. I'm going to go help the poor and I'm going to go to the people in prison. I'm going to do all these things. And then I'm going to what? I'm going to earn heaven. I'm in. I'm going to do all the things. But he doesn't say because. He says for. Which means for isn't causal. It's like, for you were, all, you were doing all these things. Why are you doing all these things? Because I said you're supposed to do all these things and this is a command? No. Because I can't not do these things. Right? Um, again, I keep uh, referencing the retreat, but we, we, you know, we, when you look at like a fireman and the house is on fire, nobody wants to go into a house that's on fire. Right? Not a good idea. But a fireman does, it's like instinctual. And when the house goes on fire, the guy just runs in because he can't not run in. That's his job. He's trained to go into houses that are on fire and find babies and kittens, dogs. So, um, cause nobody's cat people around here. That's for sure. And so when he has, when we have a life with Christ and he is our eyes and our ears and our arms and our heart, and I see someone who's sick, can I, can I turn around and walk away? 
someone who's broken, someone who's at the margin, someone who's been marginalized by the population, can I? Are you capable of doing it? It's impossible. So again, Christ is saying, these are the signs of, of someone who's living with me. When I'm your dad, you act like your dad and you think like your dad. And so you do all the things your dad did without even thinking I'm supposed to be meek, I'm supposed to be humble, I'm supposed to help the poor, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do that. And then it's a long list of things I'm supposed to do. And I gotta remember all the things I gotta do. If you look at the list of all things I'm supposed to do, it's like millions of things. Well, it's much simpler than that, right? I acquire the spirit of God and then all these things just sort of happen, right? How do I love someone unconditionally? I have no idea, right? But when I love God unconditionally and he loves me unconditionally and I feel that, then all of a sudden it just sort of happens. And I can't really give you a prescription on how to do that. Does that make sense? St. Maximus says, he who busies himself with the sins of others or judges his brother on suspicion has not yet even begun to repent or to examine himself as to discover his own sins. Abu Nushar Kamal used to say the exact same thing. Anyone who judges anyone else has not begun to repent yet. Because if you think about what repentance is, is simply acknowledging my disease, okay? And I was, I was love this example of, of thinking of going into an emergency room, right? Imagine walking into an emergency room at two in the morning on a Saturday night, right? It's full of people, right? This guy's got alcohol poisoning. This guy's got a broken arm. This guy's got blood coming out of his nose. This guy's got blood coming out of his eyeballs. This guy's got a ch chain, a, uh, a chest pains, okay? Can you imagine? I'm curious who it is too now. I just kind of want to know. It's someone important. It's just a, just, no. Someone trying to sell us something. I think we just... Let the ring take care of him. Okay. Um, so imagine if, if, if uh, there's an emergency room and I walk in, Mark, and uh, I walk in the, the waiting room and I say, hey, what, what are you in for? And he says, oh, I got this, you know, heart condition. I'm like, oh, you probably ate a lot of cholesterol, you fat pig. That's disgusting. What are you in for? Well, I fell off a tree and I broke my arm. What are you, an idiot? Who climbs a tree? What's wrong with you? Hey, what are you, what are you in for? Uh, I've got cancer. Oh, you probably had a lot of chemicals. You probably didn't eat healthy. You know, you should have known better. Hey, hey, what are you in for? And I just kind of went around the waiting room and just insulted everybody. Sounds like uh, most of our parents, right? So then at some point, I'd hope the nurse would come up to me and say, excuse me, sir, uh, do you have a medical emergency? I mean, no, I'm fine. I'm great. I'm super healthy. I'm the best. And she say, you know, you should just leave because this is a place for sick people, right? I would ask, I'd hope she'd ask me to leave. And so every once in a while you come to church and there's people who are just looking for everyone else's diseases. And you ask them, hey, what are you here for? And they're like, I'm fine. I'm holy. I'm righteous. I'm the good people. I'm just here to point out everyone else's sickness at church. And then you got to tell her what Jesus said, which is, you know, I came for those who are sick, not those who are well. Those who are well don't need a physician. So actually, you don't even need to be here, ma'am or sir. You can go home because you're fine. You're righteous. And of course, we know St. Paul says, no one is righteous. No, not one. But since you're righteous, you should just go home until you realize how unrighteous you are and then come back here because this is a place for sick, broken people. And so what St. Maximus is saying, what Abu Nusha Kamal said is, once you're busying yourself and judging other people, you're not repenting, right? Because at some point, you know, if you have cancer and you're walking around this emergency room making fun of everybody and then someone says, well, don't you have cancer? You'd be like, yeah, I guess I do. They're like, shouldn't you go get chemo or something? And like, yeah, it's a good idea. Maybe I'll go get chemo. But if you don't know you have cancer, you just want to poke at everybody else. So this is from uh, Father Matthew the Poor. He says, learn from me for I'm gentle and lonely in heart is what Christ said. The lesson of love can never be taught simply by pre-arranged words and anecdotes. Rather, it is taught by truly giving yourself and communicating the love and longing for Christ to those you serve. So who are you, what are you giving to the kids? Pre-arranged words, lessons, curriculum, 
lesson plans, reading to them from the book. Is that what we give the kids? He says, it is taught by giving yourself. Who is you? I am Christ, and he is the one who lives in me. And longing for Christ to those, and you're the, communicating the love and longing for Christ that you have to those you serve. He says, the lesson of humility cannot be taught by, taught, taught by intellectual persuasion, but only by a prolonged and bitter struggle against one's ego. How many humility lessons have we heard in our lives? Verses and anecdotes and stories. And he's saying, you want to teach a kid humility? Don't give him a lesson about humility. What does he say to do? A prolonged and bitter struggle against one's ego. That's the lesson of humility. And you know what? You can tell when someone's been in that long and bitter struggle and when someone hasn't. It's a big difference. The lesson of purity cannot be taught by informing spiritual children of lofty ideas or by describing historical examples or by training them in rules or techniques. Rather, it comes first and foremost through the servant's willingness to scrub out the spots in his children's lives. A mother cannot tolerate seeing her child covered in filth. Therefore, she patiently and persistently cleans her baby, her child, on a daily basis. So, what's the goal of Sunday school? What are we trying to do? What's the objective? The goal of Christianity and Sunday school is the absorption of Christ, first and foremost. It is not to teach history, it is not to preserve traditions, it is not to maintain the status quo, it is not to teach, 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 it is the absorption of him in our lives. We are called Christians, Christ is in the middle of that. Any objective other than that, other than that objective, can be dangerous. What's the outcome of this absorption? It could be morality, it could be helping the poor, it could be serving others, it could be isolation and solitude. I don't know how you're going to turn out. All of us are unique. Everyone has a different calling. Right? Some people are called to be alone when they find Christ. And some people are called to be in crowds when they find Christ. So which one leads to heaven? The absorption or the outcome? What's the goal? Can someone be moral and not Christian? Yep. Can someone help the poor and not be Christian? Yep. Can someone serve others and not be Christian? Yep. Can someone live in solitude and be like a hermit and not Christian? Yeah, they're you know, like the Unabomber, right? And crazy guys. So that's not the objective. It's not to do these things. It's to absorb Christ in our life. In fact, when they do studies on morality of Christians versus non-Christians, guess what they find? Not good news for us. Same. Very little difference in morality between Christians and non-Christians. Yeah, you know, well, there's you. You're probably in the sample, so that, that dragged us way down. You know, we can, we, can, we can go back and forth. I can chew you up and spit you out. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> and so we don't do very well. So what does that mean? Does that mean Christianity has failed? It didn't do the desired outcome? No. That's not the outcome of Christianity. That's morality. Christianity is to find him. Am I still broken? Yep. Am I still a sinner? Yep. But now he carries me, and now he's in me. And so that's why in baptism, in the, in the, in the ceremony of baptism, we use this beautiful word. We say you are grafted into the body of Christ. Like when you're grafted in, you know, when, you know anyone here a botanist, you ever graft a, a branch? You take one branch, like an olive branch, and you can graft it into like a fig tree. And then the, 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 the olive branch will grow and take nutrients from the fig tree. It's quite amazing. And so baptism in the ceremony, we say you're grafted into this body. So we take this branch that's going to be dead, and we put it into the body of Christ, and it absorbs the nutrients from it, right? This is what the absorption of Christ is. Okay. Uh, all right. Abu Nadud Lamai, he says, Above all, what sets, us, what sets us apart as Christians is love. We shall be asked by God, How much did you love? Whom did you love? Did you love everyone or only some? How did you love them? 
Nothing can transform people the way love can. Nothing can transform your children the way love can. And this is especially true for Sunday school ch children. I want you to think of the most influential Sunday school teacher in your life. Can you think of him her, or her? Now tell me the lessons they gave. Not so much. So it isn't about the lessons they gave. No one cares about your lessons. No one even remembers your lessons. No one even likes your lessons. They're boring. But they love you. And they love you because you love them. And so the most influential Sunday school teacher in your life is the person who looked at you and was just crazy about you and wanted to hear about your week. And I don't care what kind of lesson they gave. Nothing can lead others to repentance. Oh, sorry. Nothing can transform your service the way love can. Nothing can lead others to repentance the way love can. Neither logic nor sermons nor even miracles can have the same transformative effect with effect which pure Christian love has. And this is so true, right? I remember I heard someone talking about a sermon. He said he was at uh, St. Mary of Zaytun. He watched the apparition. He saw her on the dome of the church. And he said the next week he was doing the same thing he was doing the week before. And then he said, you know, I saw millions of people see her. Did we have millions of converts? Did we have millions of changed lives? We actually didn't. Because when I first read this, you know, not even miracles, I'm like, well, miracles for sure. And then you start seeing people who've seen miracles. And they're just as messed up as the people who haven't seen miracles. Christian love is derived, meaning that it is the love of Christ towards his children through you. Christian love is a grace from God above all. I think I'll stop. I think I'm almost done. Um, oh, that's a good quote. All right. Does anybody have any questions? I have so many good quotes. I don't want to, like, stop. But Which one? change I have no idea right I mean when 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 Jesus raised the guy who was paralyzed they said you did it on Saturday I can't help you man when they see him casting out demons they well you're the prince of demons I don't know monkeys <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story I shouldn't say any of these things one time I heard a priest give a really nice sermon. Amazing. And so I asked someone who I shall remain, priest shall remain anonymous. Everyone shall remain anonymous in the story other than me. So I asked this person, what did you think of uh, Buna's Waz? Wasn't it good? <laughs> and she said, yeah, it was really good. <laughs> All right. Glad you got something out of that. So she said, <laughs> judging that he didn't have an on. And it was a life-changing sermon. All right. You do you, boo. Sad. But that's when you get, you know, I mean, raise someone, and then you say, you shouldn't have done that on Saturday. Too bad. You suck. I think, I think people see miracles all the time. And there are many wonder workers. I mean, I, I, I've, I, you know, I know people have had many experiences with Krillos, people in my family, et cetera, et cetera. And they were pretty cool, but it's not like they became monks, priests, whatever. They're just kind of regular old people with egos and problems and everything else. Yeah, it's, it takes more than pops and snaps. Yep. Who has the best <laughs> questions? Um, so I really like what you've been saying. Uh, and like he always compliments talks. me first, which yeah, is very yeah. nice. And then I hit you with the punch. Then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, like, I'm trying to reconcile this idea of, like, helping the person or, like, attacking the lion instead of the person. But then you kind of mentioned, like, 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 how can I help you at this moment? Like, like Pharaoh, when he hardened his heart against, like, all these miracles, like, at what point does it become the person? And, like, I'm trying to reconcile, like, everything in the Old Testament when David says, I slew the sinners of the land, I've disdained the evil worker. Like, how do we, like, balance between, like, hating abhorring sin but also like loving a person if that makes sense because it's like 
I get mixed signals from the Bible. Like sometimes it's telling me to like hate the sinners, but then at the other time the New Testament, God like erased all that. But then God is the same God in the Old Testament, the New Testament. So it's like all confuzzled in my head. Confuzzled. Nice. I'm going to use that word. Is it? And I'm actually going to tell people I invented it. You know, just say, oh yeah, I invented that. Um, so let me address that last point because I think it's a very common uh, point. So, um, you know, when, when, we, when we read the Old Testament, um, you know, you have to be, you know, St. Augustine says that everything in the Old Testament um, transfigures and, and points to Christ. And I can only read the Old Testament through Christ, through that vision. Um, one of the, 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 the slides I passed up on the first talk was, what did the Pharisees do wrong? And if I think about the Pharisees, right, they, were, they studied the Old Testament, obviously. They were scholars, learned, really knew their stuff, really knew Hebrew, all the things. And when they studied it and studied it and thought about it and thought about it and distilled it and put it all together and, and memorized it and did all, they came up with Pharisee, right? That was, and they came up with an image of God and they said, that's the image of God. This is what we're supposed to be. No miracles on Saturday, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I think about what the Pharisees did wrong, I mean, Jesus has the seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees. And some of them were human traditions, like you worship the altar, the gold, the gold on the altar. You swear by the gold on the altar, not by the altar itself. And you have your man-made traditions and stuff like that. But when I really think about them, they didn't really do anything wrong. I mean, the stuff they were saying was stuff God said. I mean, they're just repeating things. They're repeating the scripture, the Old Testament. You know, in fact, they executed perfectly perfectly. So is it possible that you can be so right on the Old Testament and be so wrong? Yeah. And so one, one of the reasons Christ came was to manifest and incarnate God to say, if I were to be a human, what would I look like? What would I talk like? What would I act like? And so in him is the embodiment of the entire Old Testament. Okay. So every time I look to the Old Testament, and we have to do it very carefully, right? Because we see people like the Pharisees who were scholars in the Old Testament and who got it quite wrong. So I, I would be very careful going in because everyone can find me a, a fire and brimstone verse from the Old Testament. Not too hard to do. And every once in a while when I want to hate somebody, <laughs> I, I, I pull out one of those verses. And I say, hey, God said, hate that guy. Right? So what I have to do is every time I look at one of these verses, I have to say, okay, let me, but let's, let's think about Jesus here for a second. Because he, he's the embodiment of the entire Old Testament. He's all of it. He's perfect. It's in him. So when he's my vision, it helps me scale where I'm at, right? So when I read a verse and it says, do not, you know, be with these people and do not. And I go, oh, yeah, but, but Jesus was. Hmm. Maybe he... he we, I should read it a little differently. You know, maybe I shouldn't participate with these people in their sin. But can Jesus go into Zacchaeus' house, even though he's a pretty bad guy? Sure. And did people judge Jesus for going into Zacchaeus' house because he's a bad guy? Sure. But see, they judged Jesus for one of two reasons. They thought either he wants to participate with Zacchaeus, right? He wants to be a tax collector. He, he wants money. Or maybe he wants to condone Zacchaeus and say, yeah, Zacchaeus, you're doing a good job. Way to tax collect. But Jesus had a third objective, right? He was going in to show light to Zacchaeus, an unrepentant Zacchaeus. Curious, yes, but unrepentant. And when he went into that unrepentant, filthy man's house and, sat and, and was with him, stayed with him, that man came out, I'm giving half, half my money away. Right? So he went into the darkness to show light. So now you take a verse like, I'm, I'm not supposed to sit with sinners. Oh, okay, hang on. 
What does sit with sinners mean? It means participate with them. Right? But if I can go in and I can be light, then be light, because that's what Jesus did. Now, sometimes what happens is we get confused, right? Because there's, there's discernment, right? Uh, good, good uh, uh, bad company corrupts good morals, right? So if, say I'm an, a former alcoholic, right? And I've been, you know, on the, on the wagon for 10 years. I haven't had a drink for 10 years. And a friend of mine says, hey, let's hang out. Let's go to the bar and, you know, you can just have water and I'll have whiskey. I'm pretty stupid if I go to the bar, right? That's discernment. Now, I'm not saying you're a bad person, judging, blah, blah, blah. I can't go there. I'm too weak to go there. Now, someone else might be able to go there. Someone doesn't have an alcohol problem. You know, if, if someone said to me, hey, go meet me at a bar, I'll meet you at the bar. I don't care. I'm, not, I'm fine. Okay? But if you don't feel like you can, then don't. So as a young person, you have to have that discernment. Right? You know, two 20-year-olds go, hey, let's go to the strip club and, you know, talk about the Bible. It's not wise. Right? It's just not going to end well. You know, but yeah, but I'm light and I want to, you know, convert the strippers and I want to, you know, no. Yeah, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> yeah, this isn't a good idea. Right? So we have to have this, this kind of, have this kind of discernment. But what you want to be careful of is as we get older, right? Now you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, whatever, right? You know, th there are places I can go meet people where they're at. I can, I can condescend to their level. I can meet someone in a place, right? I can, I, can, I can sit with a drug addict and we can talk about drugs and he can tell me how it makes him feel and we can go through that conversation and I'm not worried about taking drugs. You might be able, you might not. You might like, really, what's that like? Wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah, it's euphoric. But you know, we need to talk about my drug problem. Yeah, but maybe I should try it so I, can, I know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, who knows? I'm not, you know, I'm not saying you, but. So you have to be very careful and discerning as a young person, but I think, and even as an old person, right? But I think sometimes we get a little bit too, you know, that's them and this is us. That's the good place, you know, that's the bad place is the good place. Right, and we, we do a little bit too much. And then we, we find a verse in the Old Testament that conveniently fits our narrative, in my opinion. Uh, Ashraf, you had a... Alhamdulillah, yes. Abuna, anything to add or? Um, I'm also confuzzled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you mean using my word? Yeah, the, I find the Old Testament I find it and puzzling. Very, yes, I f an eye for an eye, and I just find God very wrathful and harsh and maybe mean and just like really, you know. But the 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 God, the New Testament God and Jesus who came to Earth and all that is like my dad. Like you said, he's your dad and you love him and all that. But the Old Testament is like sometimes really hard to wrap your head around, like burning cities and and floods and just like the wrath and, and it's it is very hard to reconcile both of them yeah I, I see that and I and I, I suffer from the same thing sometimes I'll tell you I heard a talk um, by a, 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 an amazing priest um, maybe I won't say his name but and he went through you know he just took regular stories like Cain and Abel and and he just went through them and, and the story of David and he just went through them piece by piece and, and, when, when, and when he presents it in the light of Christ, you know, he's kind of like, look, this isn't a different God. Let me show you how patient he was and how kind he was and how many chances he gave. Um, and so that really helped me sort of see like, you know, we, you know we're, we're never talking about two gods here, right? Um, but I will say that like humans, like the, the stage, like if you, if you were to, if you were to, ask my kids, right, and say, you know, what's your dad like, right? First I'll say he's stupid and bald, but the next thing they'll say is, yeah, he's pretty understanding and he's, you know, he's a nice guy and he gets me and, you know, they may say those things, right? If you ask them 14 years ago, they'd be like, he's kind of a tyrant, he loses his temper all the time, you know, it's my way or the highway, 
He doesn't give us any free will. He doesn't blah, 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 right? And so mankind was kind of along the same journey of children to adult, right? And so all of that stuff I did to them when they were little that they hated and they were, you know, this dad's an authoritarian dictator and all this stuff, right? Um, it, it paved the way so that when, I, when, when they got to know me, they appreciated me, right? And then they, they can revel in, in who I actually am, right? Um, and so that to me is kind of that, that path of the Old Testament, right? Where he had to deal very harshly and very sharply with people because he was very trying to clearly take them in a, in a particular path. And I want to add one more thing. Like, you know, when you read that, you know, I don't know, 70,000 people got swallowed up, you know, with, when the time of Moses. I don't know that those people went to hell either, right? So we're looking at it as a human, right? Like, oh, man, he killed them. Okay, I, maybe he did. Yeah, sure. But that doesn't mean he sent them all to hell. Maybe they're all in heaven. I don't know, right? They just, they were, they were following the wrong path. He wanted them to follow Moses, not this other guy. Okay, just make sure all these people not following Moses go away, right? Because I want you to follow the true leader who's going to take you to the promised land. Okay, and I don't know that they all didn't go to heaven, right? So I'm looking at it as he killed them, that's bad. But maybe it isn't, right? Maybe a second afterwards, they saw the glory of God and they're like, wow, thanks for killing us because, you know, life in Sinai sucks anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then and then Jesus at some point says, "I've called you friends to his disciples, right?" And this is God. And so, yeah, two from one couple. I don't know if that's allowed. Well, she took all the airtime. Now I get nothing. <laughs> um, there's a there's a couple of things that I maybe just need a little bit of clarification on. One is the uh, the monk that hid that covered up the sin of, if you want to call it that, I mean, I guess it is. Anyway, uh, of the one that the had the woman under Same the mask. Same yeah. Uh, the way you phrased it, or you positioned it, is for us to sort of say, yeah, no, good point. But really, isn't that condoning the behavior? Shouldn't he, like, what's the takeaway for all the other monks there, other than to say, okay, well... I guess that's okay then. And he did something wrong and got away with it. Kind of like the thief on the right who had the best of both worlds, literally. Because he had an amazing life and then in the, in the last second there, he just earned his way in. So Jesus enabled that. But he repented ah. in the last second. Mm. Did the one, did the monk that had the person hidden under the basket, did he then learn a lesson from that? And did the people viewing what happened learn a lesson I think the story went, on, went on to say that he had a harem living in his cell after that. I'm kidding. Um, no, he did repent after that. And he did not. He did. He's saying he did. He did. And his repentance came because of the compassion of this man, right? I mean, if he had gone after him and said, you know, what kind of, you know, who do you think you are? And blah, blah, blah. He'd say, well, you know, I'm out here by myself and this sucks and I, and it's hard to fight temptation. And, you know, that guy over there does it too. And right. That's probably how this ends. You know, that, that book I told you guys about last, uh, yesterday, the wounded by love. There's a second. Right. So, you know, we talked about shame, not being a part of, of the, of Christ's message. And, and this book wounded by love, which I think is a proverb. You know, think about that phrase, wounded by love. Like, what does that mean, to be wounded by love? Right? And, and I imagine, you know, the adulterous woman who is about to be stoned to death. And Christ says, I don't judge you. And he makes the people that are about to kill her go away. Is he enabling adultery? Is he encouraging it? Right? In fact... You know, she's probably been cussed out by every woman in that village. Stay away from my husband, right? The Samaritan woman at the well was there at noon. I'm sure she got kilmitin from lots of women in that village. I know who you are and you don't come near my man and blah, 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 right? Didn't fix anything. Didn't change her, right? So a lot of times I think what we're talking about is, is an approach. How do you approach a sinner, 
right? And sometimes the gentle, loving approach is what, it's what melts them, right? And so that monk melted when he looked at his, the father just sitting there going, oh my God, he knows what I did. He's covering me and he's still looking at me the way he's looking at me. I'd do anything for this guy. I do for the, for, and he saw God in that and that melts people, right? So I think sometimes we're really big on the, you know, hit them with the, with the stick approach. And for some people, maybe there's a time and a place, like there's stories of, but for most people, no, the, the loving approach, the one Christ showed is effective, right? And, and we all know this, even psychology, right? This, this being understood and being appreciated and being loved that, and that unconditional feeling, that's, that's what melts people. And that's the only thing that's ever worked, you know, and it's what Christ did over and over with every sinner. The only time he got upset was with the clergy, right? With the Pharisees, the people who use God for their own gain, for their own ego, for controlling other people. That pissed them off, right? But everybody else, every sinner, just super gentle. Right? Now, I have to say, like, you have to be smart, right? I mean, you know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll have a youth or something somebody who's, you know, have, has some maybe, I don't want to say psychological disorder, but some issue, right? And sometimes they're seeking my attention, right? And so then they'll say, I, I, you know, I feel this, I, I want this, I want, and I'm getting a lot of texts. And I have to be a little bit wise, right? Because I may be enabling attention-seeking behavior. I may be encouraging them to do things so they can get my attention. So every once in a while, I cut off the attention, right? And I, and I don't know if I'm doing the right thing, right? But sometimes you just have to be a little wise there, right? So God give us all that grace, I think. But for me, the, the first approach shouldn't be that, you know, like, you know, young people do this to all, each other all the time, right? Young person say, you know, I, you know, I, I did something with this girl, I did, you know, and the other person just attacks them. And you're like, well, I know it's wrong, Right? That's why I'm telling you, right? I mean, I, I know I messed up. Last thing I need to do is make me feel like, like crap. And now I, I don't even want to come to church because I know if, if you tell your mom, I'm done. Right? And every, everyone that looks at me, I'm thinking, does, does she know? Does she know? Does she know? Right? So, it's, again, that doesn't mean I'm enabling it. Right? I'm not saying, oh, you did a good job. Right? But I'm just saying, you know, I'm still going to love you. I'm with you. And the person knows exactly what you think. I mean, I've... I've you know, I, I have people who text me and, they're like, and they'll tell me they messed up again. They know I don't condone it, obviously, but they know they can come to me, right? And they know I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna judge them. In fact, I'm the only person they'll go to to tell these bad things, right? And they know exactly how I stand on these things. So I think that's sort of the sweet spot, right? If you can, so St. Macarius did that, right? Sweet spot, I'm a monk. You know where I stand on having a woman in your room. Right? But I'm going to show you the love of God. And that's what melted him, the other monk. Everything else he would have just said, forget this. I can't handle this. I'm done. I'm out. You know, I'm just going to move in with her. She was already moved in with him. So. <laughs> um, the second part, if I may have a second part, is... You may. You said the the person who keeps telling themselves to be humble be humble be humble is not humble but isn't that how you get to that level for example if you <clears throat> naturally are not a humble person does that mean you're a write-off that's it no the way to get to be humble is that self-coaching of be humble be humble be humble and when you let your thoughts get away with you Especially if somebody compliments you and you think, yeah, you know what? I am awesome. Like you have beautiful eyes. Thank Just you. Saying. I appreciate that. Just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but isn't that... Exactly. Now, now I'm going to be spending the rest of the day saying, no, man. Just be humble. Be humble. Be humble. But isn't that the way to, to get to that end goal? Um, I don't think so. So what I, what I think there's two things mixed up in there, right? So I think the first thing you... you <coughs> you are right with is acknowledging that I'm not humble. So that's just awareness and recognition, right? So you should definitely think to yourself, gosh, I'm not being humble right now. Okay, that's good. The, the next thing, and since we're going about 
talking about eyes, we'll just go there. I, and I know you want to compliment mine. That's fine. They're just brown. It's okay. They're gorgeous. Thank you. I, I get told that a lot. Um, the, <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, so, you know, C.S. Lewis has this, uh, this quote. I, I said it a lot yesterday in the, in the retreat the day before. You know, being humble isn't denying what God's given you. All right? So you say, you know, um, you have beautiful blue eyes. I'm not even complimenting you, really, am I? Like, I'm complimenting your parents, God, all right? You're getting nothing. Say your wife's nodding. Yeah, yeah, okay? So, um, so you, you can't really take credit for that, right? And you can actually say, yeah, I do have beautiful eyes, and glory be to God, all right? Because I did nothing for these things, all right? Same like with my hair, just natural. Just, <laughs> it just comes this way, right? So, um, so that isn't humility, you, you know, is saying, no, my eyes are ugly, no, they're not. They're beautiful, but, but glory be to God, they're not mine, right? So the, the, the movement towards humility is simply acknowledging reality, you know? That's how you get real humility. So the first step is, gosh, I'm not being humble. You know, I'm, I'm kind of cocky. I kind of think I have beautiful eyes, or I, I'm, a, I'm a great speaker, or I'm a great artist, or I'm a great singer, or I have a beautiful voice, or whatever. And then the next step is, okay, that wasn't humble. Why am I not being humble? Let me think about this. And now the, the digging deep comes in. And then once you come to the realization that what I have is a gift, everything I have is a gift, then it sort of works itself from the ground up. Right? Like, well, why am I being arrogant? I, I didn't do this. You know? And I had this experience when uh, our, our iconographers were painting our chapel. And these guys are from Canada, so you may know them. You know, Carlos Collada and George. And, and I, would, you know, I would give them an, like my idea for a wall. I'd say, you know, let's, let's make it look like this and this and this. And they would just, oh, so something like this, like this, like this, because they were staying at my house. Boom, boom, they just start drawing, and they just do it, right? And I'm like, wow, that looks like they could just draw. So amazing, right? And I love icons, right? I, I'm all into icons. I'm all about icons, right? I can't draw a stick figure to save my life. I can't draw anything, right? I go to Egypt. I tell the iconographers what I want, and they do it. It's my idea, and I just use, use your hands, Okay. But as they're doing this thing, I have to think to myself, first thing I thought is glory be to God. Look what he gave these guys, right? But if, that, if, if, if George thought to himself, and I know you're listening, George. If George thought to himself, man, you know, I'm holier than Mark. I'm amazing. Look at me draw. I'd be like, that's a gift. That's not yours. It doesn't make you better than me. It doesn't make you holier than me. It doesn't make me holier than you. That's a gift from God. And you're using it for God's glory. That's wonderful, but it doesn't make you, you see what I'm saying? So that's just reality. Now, delusion would be for him to become arrogant and to think, I'm an amazing artist. I am an amazing artist. That's delusional, right? Because that's just not the reality. You're dust, and God gave you this gift, right? So humility is, is, is a ground, is from the inside out. But aren't you robbing George of the effort that he's put in to perfect his art? Whatever. I mean, yeah, I mean, he practiced, but the, the colonel, the, I could put in 30 times his effort, and then I draw a bad stick figure. So, no, he has a gift any way you slice it. Right? It's kind of like the, the person who can throw a 100-mile-per-hour fastball. You know, you could, you could give me this practice as much as I want. I'm never throwing a 100 mile per hour fastball and hitting the, hitting the mitt. That's a gift. God giving them the environment and the time and All whatever the to work on. Right? Exactly. Right. right? And for at any point for time, that pitcher to think, I'm amazing because I can throw a ball and he can't. That's delusional. Even if we both work the same and I work 10 times as hard as he did. So what if it's not a talent, but it's an opinion, or it's a, a thought? Um, where you have an opinion that just based on good time management skills or things that you have developed throughout the years, that you think that opinion is right. Um, I, I struggle with should I let it be known? Should I keep it to myself? Should I not argue? If somebody else has another opinion, do I just, how do I like discern humility in that? Okay, you are right. 
even if deep down inside, I know they're not. It's, it's really hard to do. I keep going back, uh, you know, in, in the service, in marriage, in relationships, and I keep going back to St. John the Short. Plant a stick in the dirt and be obedient. And to me, that's sort of a basis thing. It's really not a good idea, but God blesses everything. And so every once in a while, I just let my thing down and say, you know what, God, you blessed this really bad idea. And more times than not, he does. And I'm like, wow. And a lot of times it does not turn out the way I expected. And I'm like, wow, all right. I stand corrected. God can do miracles, it turns out, even with this monkey. Halas, halas tu? Everyone tired? You look tired, Mary. Nimti, Nissa, how about you? Any other questions, comments? Who wants to sleep? Me. Now, I'm not, not a very, you know, good environment. And yes, and glory be to God forever. Listen. All right, before we go, we want to give a big thank you to Archdeacon Mark. A uh, big... We're not clapping for him. We know this. I know this, but we want to thank you. Uh, hopefully, you could take this little uh, gift from us. Uh, just an icon of St. Verena. Wow. Unless you want St. Maurice. We have, or you want both. We have both. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't know which one to bring. It's always hard. But thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, Hold in the mic. And thank you for everybody. Thank you for everybody that organized. We know this was a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much, uh, Archdeacon, for being so flexible with us and changing the plans, whether it was two days at the retreat or here. But we really benefited, or at least I got uh, a little bit of the, the last day. So we really benefited. I'm sure the rest did. And we're going to live on these words uh, for a long time. Thank you. And don't be a stranger. We'd love to have you again sometime soon. God bless you. Pray for us. We could stand up for a quick prayer. Oh, next time in LA. Okay. So we'll just ask Deacon to conclude in prayer for us. Yeah, it's okay. Just last a little. You do business. We'll get somewhere here. Yeah. <laughs> She's saying no already. Do you want to pray for us? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a mighty God, that you love us unconditionally. We thank you, God, for your word, that it's alive and it works in us. And I pray, God, that uh, the word that we heard today would bear fruit in our hearts and that we would live by it. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. We pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace, the peace of the Lord be with you.